Good day. My name is Gian Domenico Borazio, and I'm a palliative care physician. This means I am a doctor who every day takes care of patients with incurable diseases at the end of their lives. Believe it or not, it's a wonderful job. And I'm going to tell you why. And why the results of our research in palliative care have profound implications not only for the dying, but for all of us as well. So let's start with a couple of facts about dying. Number one, we're all going to die. Number two, we all act like we are not, most of the time. At a lecture in Harvard, once a student refused to answer a question on death because she said, I'm afraid that if I talk about my own death, I will die. And a fellow student remarked from the side, okay, so you think that if you don't, you won't? <laughs> in this respect, we can learn a lot from the wisdom of ancient cultures and religions like Buddhism. The Tibetan master, Sogyal Rinpoche, once said, if you are afraid of dying, I have good news for you. I can guarantee you that you will all die successfully. <laughs> and he also gave an excellent description of the dying process. You breathe out, you can't breathe in, that's it. And these statements are much more profound than they seem at first glance. Because in life, we're always looking for certainties, aren't we? Well, the only thing that we can be 100% certain of is that we will die. How's that for an uplifting statement? And indeed, we do need to get our act together because this life is all we've got. And as one of the most important women in the history of medicine said, it is not the worst thing for people to find out that they have lived and are now going to die. The worst thing is to find out that one hasn't lived and one is now going to die. And this is the woman who said this. Dame Cicely Saunders, was an amazing personality. She was a doctor, a nurse, and a social worker. She called herself a one-woman multi-professional team. And she is the founder of modern palliative care. In 1967, she founded the first modern-day hospice, St. Christopher's Hospice in London. And from there, she proceeded to inspire generations of physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains, psychologists, and a host of other professions who all now work for the silent revolution in medicine that is called palliative care. But what exactly is palliative care? Well, the World Health Organization offers the following definition. The aim of palliative care is improving quality of life not just prolonging it. The target are all patients with life-threatening illnesses and their families at the same time. And the means to get there is the treatment of all physical, psychosocial, and spiritual problems, again, at the same level. So, this sounds very good. We have the aim of improving quality of life. But, in modern medicine, we need to prove that we reach our aims. Now, how do you prove that you improve quality of life? This is not very easy because quality of life means different things to different people, like this, or for others, it may be this. So, it's complicated. Many smart people have tried to define quality of life. One of the smartest was a British physician called Sir Kenneth Kelman. And in the 80s, he offered the following definition. Quality of life equals reality minus expectations. It's interesting. And this difference, reality minus expectations, is now called Kalman's gap. Let's look at an example from real life. So, this is the graph showing a person who's quite successful. He has a good job, a big house, a fast car, but he's not that totally happy because his expectations are even higher than that. He wants a better job, a bigger house, a faster car, so his Kalman gap is negative. That's why it's shown in red here. Now, to make things worse, 
this poor fellow gets the diagnosis of an incurable illness. So his reality plummets and his Kelman gap becomes hugely negative. And he cannot really keep up with his expectations. And so he keeps a very bad quality of life, Kelman's gap, until death. And I'm showing you this because, on the one hand, in medicine, all the time we are trying to change reality. And we are more or less successful with that. We maybe should look a little better at the expectations of our patients and their families. But for all of us, there is a message here as well. It may not be the best idea in life to raise our expectations higher and higher with time. In fact, it's one of the best ways to unhappiness. As the writer Anne Lamott said, expectations are resentments under construction. So, we would like to do science with quality of life. Unfortunately, for uh, the Kalman gap to be measured, that's not very easy nor very reliable. So we need something better. And in order to uh, get there and to show you how that, what that means for you personally, I first need to introduce you to this fellow. Jean-Martin Charcot lived in France in the 19th century. He was a psychiatrist. He was nicknamed the Napoleon of Neuroses. I think you can all see why. He al he's also regarded as the founder of modern neurology. And one of his most impressive discoveries was a new disease characterized by progressive muscle weakness until death. He called the disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Until a few years ago, very few people knew anything about ALS. Today, you all do. Because this is the disease so many people threw ice water over their heads for. Anybody here who did it, by the way? Any chance? Anybody? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Great. So, I'm now going to introduce you to my, one of my favorite ALS patients, Mr. G. This is Mr. G, the way modern medicine sees him, a collection of deficits. He can't walk, he's in a wheelchair, he can't speak, he has a communicator, he can't swallow, he has a feeding tube, you don't see it, and of course he can't breathe, he is ventilated. I can assure you that many of my colleagues, seeing a patient this way, modern medicine does, would ask themselves, why hasn't he committed suicide yet? But in palliative care, we learn to look at the resources a patient has at his social environment. So we need to look at the big picture. And if we do that, I hope you believe me that this patient at that time had a very good quality of life. Indeed, I think better than most of his doctors and nurses. And the reason for that was the wonderful relationship with his wife. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But this picture also asks the question, well, what is then quality of life? The best answer I know of comes from Ireland. Professor Kieran O'Boyle in Dublin, a psychologist, said simply, quality of life is whatever the patient says it is. Now, this sounds trivial, but in fact, this is a sentence you can do science with. All you need to do, this is quite revolutionary in modern medicine, is you have to listen to the patients. And Kiernobyl did just that. He asked the patients, what are the areas that give quality to your life? And we asked the questions to ALS patients, and what they said is, by and large, the two most important uh, uh, areas were health and family. This is not very surprising. But if you look at the data, health was only important for half of the severely ill patients. Family was important for each and every one of them. And those who had health had a lower quality of life than those who didn't choose health as an important area for their quality of life. And this was very interesting because at that time, when physicians tried to measure quality of life, what they did was actually measuring physical function, what the body can do. They still do this today, unfortunately. So if you look at a disease like ALS, which is progressing, with those scales that look at physical function, 
no matter which scale you use, all you see is this, they all go down. So you would think the quality of life of these patients goes down all the time. But if you use the individual quality of life method, asking the patient what is important for him, the same group of patients shows a quality of life which is basically unchanged over time. So from this, we can obviously draw the conclusion individual quality of life is not correlated with physical function. And this requires some thinking. Because now we are getting out of the classical paradigm of modern medicine where prolongation of life and physical function is all there is. Here, at the end of life, this is obviously not true. So, there must be other determinants of quality of life at the end of life that are not physical. Any ideas? Dignity? Any other ideas? Oh, come on, you, you must have some ideas. <laughs> Love, very good. Hope, spirituality, all of these non-physical determinants can be important at the end of life. And indeed, we have studied several of them. I'm going to show you the data on two, which are particularly relevant for all of us. Personal values. We all have a core set of values in our lives. And meaning in life. We all want our lives to have some meaning. When we look at personal values in palliative care patients, then we see something very interesting. In all patients studied, altruistic values were stronger than egoistic values. This is a very stark contrast to the general population. And what happened there was that by this shift in values, the patients had an increased quality of life. This is fascinating, because obviously your values shape your quality of life. And this data poses the question, why do we have to wait until we are close to death to find out that altruism is one of the very best ways to improve our quality of life. The next thing we wanted to look at is meaning in life, and we developed a schedule for meaning in life evaluation. Uh, it has a nice acronym. It's the SMILE. And uh, with that, we asked patients, but we also asked the general population, what is important for you what gives meaning to your life? Which areas give meaning to your life? And I'm going to show you the result over the different ages in the population. And I'm using this beautiful painting by Paul Gauguin, which depicts the life cycle from right to left, from the baby, young adults, adults, until the old person. So let's look at the data in the general population. What gives meaning to life? Well, for the young, not unexpectedly, it's friends. Then it comes partnership. When one gets older, it's work. Little older, health and altruism. Remember altruism. And then spirituality and nature. And now comes the question. How satisfied are people with the meaning of their lives according to their age? And there is an interesting finding. Can you spot the midlife crisis? The midlife crisis is when we think that work is what gives meaning to our lives. Uh, the good news is it gets better later when we get older, we turn to things like altruism, spirituality and nature, our meaning in life values get higher again. But of course, this again poses the question, do we have to get to be that old to find that out? Well, the answer is no. There is a better way. Although we may not like to, thinking about death is a very powerful means to enhance our quality of life. And that's the reason why, after so many years in working in palliative care, I consider this job to be a great privilege. Because we learn a lot from our patients. And this helps us to put our priorities into perspective. I have yet to find a single dying person who would tell me, you know, Doc, I think I should have earned more money in my life. <laughs> and also, after so many years of working in palliative care, I can assure you that by and large, people die as they have lived. We once had an opera singer as a patient, and her death was really a great show. Uh, 
it wasn't very peaceful, but it was obviously her own death. So, the bottom line is, if you want to live well and die well, you first have to find out what's really important to you and stick to it. With that, you can get out there and get yourself a life, a real one. Thank you.